I would like to open this event by recognizing that McGill University is on land which long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous people whose presence have enriched this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. Avant de donner le coup d'envoi à cet événement, permettez-moi de souligner que l'Université McGill est située sur un territoire qui a longtemps été un lieu de rencontre et d'échange pour les peuples autochtones, notamment pour les nations Haudenosaunee et Anishinaabe. Nous saluons et remercions les divers peuples autochtones qui ont enrichi de leur présence ce territoire, lequel accueille aujourd'hui des gens de partout dans le monde. Welcome to the virtual At Home Homecoming for 2021. This year marks several anniversaries. The 200th anniversary of the founding of McGill University, the 100th annual homecoming celebration, and the 125th birthday of the Schulich School of Music, formerly known as the Faculty of Music. We invite you to share your experience of this year's homecoming at home with the McGill 200 hashtag and beyond the homecoming programming, explore some of the university's history at 200.mcgill.ca. Today's event is an interfaculty intergenerational conversation on the subject of elite performance, featuring three guest speakers from the Schulich School of Music, the Faculty of Education, and the Faculty of Science. This panel will be co-moderated by Dr. Dilson Rassier, the Dean of the Faculty of Education, and myself, Brenda Ravenscroft, the Dean of the Schulich School of Music. A little bit more from us now, and over to you, Dilson. Thank you, Brenda. For our conversation, we will be focusing on the many challenges faced by those pursuing elite performance, the physical, psychological, and emotional factors that can enhance uh, with the potential to impact uh, everybody uh, uh, to, to better understand successful, healthy performance. Each field has varying approaches and expertise on the subject, and our aim is to share this across disciplines to better understand and challenge conventional practices. In your fact of education, for example, we are very interested in sports science, and more specifically, what is so special about athletes being able to perform at the highest levels of performance. In order to understand that, we are currently developing a world-class sports science institute to be announced publicly in the months to come. That will be the largest of its kind in North America, housing researchers, students, and athletes pursuing the understanding of the basis of elite sports performance study physiology, biomechanics, molecular biology, psychology, among several other topics. At the Schulich School of Music, we've been working for the last two years on developing a performance science initiative. So of course, our uh, training of students is very much focused on musical performance. And what we're interested in doing is capturing understanding and inspiring new ways of thinking about learning and performing music, engaging with evidence-based strategies and learning from other fields in which performance is key. So for our, the Institute that we're starting to develop, we're working collaboratively with colleagues across McGill, with our own research center in music media and technology, and in collaboration with some institutes in London, the Royal College of Music and Imperial College. We're interested not only in the research, but we're interested in the application of that research to the training of our students so that we can ensure optimal health, physical, emotional, and psychological, and we can study our students to conduct more research. So we have a circle of research and application. Thank you, Brenda. Regarding today's session, then, the program will consist of a brief introductions by each guest, followed by a co-moderator Q&A. This event will last approximately 45 minutes. So let me start by introducing our speakers. Each panelist will be sharing a bit about their views on elite performance as it pertains to their field, and in some instances, their motivation for their work and the focus of their own research. And it's my pleasure to introduce first Dr. Richard Costner. Professor Kostner is, is, uh, is a professor at psychology at McGill University, 
where he has conducted research on human motivation for 25 years. He has published over 125 scientific articles and his recent work focuses on the importance of autonomy in the effective pursuit of personal goals. Richard received the 2007 Canadian Psychological Association Award for Excellence in Teaching and Training, and subsequently won the Principal's Prize for Excellence in Teaching from McGill University in 2008. Richard Costner, please give us your thoughts about performance. Okay, uh, I'm very excited to be part of this panel. And I can't believe I, I heard for the first time about the Sports Science Center. I'm very excited to hear about this development at the university. Uh, I've been teaching a human motivation course for 32 years. It's a popular course. And I, I, uh, I focus on goal setting and uh, kind of the difficulties we could have in pursuing goals. And it's a large course, the students are very involved. And what I learned very early here at McGill is that we have very talented students at this university, not only academically talented, but there have been several Olympic level athletes in my classes, several brilliant performing artists. And what I soon realized is that one of the things I should focus on is how to become an elite performer, how to become an expert. And fortunately, there's an amazing amount of empirical research on that. And it's very interesting. Uh, I like the work of a Swedish researcher named Anders Ericsson. He died, unfortunately, last year. But he's devoted 40 years of research to trying to understand how young people become experts and how older people remain experts. And he goes against the traditional view that we can explain it mostly by some natural talent or some special aptitudes. Instead, he summarizes an amazing body of research which suggests that uh, it's more cognitive aptitudes adaptations and physical adaptations that result from very specific kinds of practice that are extended over many, many years. It's a controversial idea. I would say three quarters of my students, they say, oh, but how about this exception? How about that exception? And the marvelous thing is that Erickson addresses all of those. And he really challenges the students to reconsider their belief in like natural talent. And I like this point of view because there's other psychology research which suggests it's best to think about our talents as something that are malleable and developable and that we could grow them. So I've been very excited teaching about elite performance. I think there's some really positive, interesting things to share with students about that. Thank you. Although born in the United States, Dr. Darius Bagley is a native of Montreal and of McGill University, where he received his medical degree in 1984 and both his licentiate in music, in piano performance, and a BSc in physiology in 1980. Dr. Bagley is a professor of surgery and physiology at the University of Toronto and a senior pediatric urologic surgeon, the associate surgeon in chief and a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick children, Sick children in Toronto. He has remained active in music throughout his medical career and has performed at numerous university and professional events in the United States, in Canada and overseas. Dr. Bagley is passionate about supporting and collaborating with young emerging professional musicians and is currently on the board of directors of the Nas National Youth Orchestra of Canada. Dr. Bagley, I invite you to give your perspectives on elite performance. Thank you so much. It's a real uh, privilege to be uh, amongst the, uh, the, these professional researchers in this area. Uh, I, I really should make a disclaimer that I, that I don't actually do research in, the, in these areas and rather like to think that I live them both. And, uh, and it's a real privilege to be here with you today. I'm a surgeon. 
Uh, and there are many different types of surgeons in the world. Uh, the work that I do is, is exclusively in children, and the work that I do in reconstructive surgery involves uh, a lot of attention to very, very small details uh, as opposed to more macro type surgery. Uh, I'm also a, a molecular biologist at our research institute and, and ha I'm really stimulated by the ideas of creativity across, across both fields. And I have to say in, in recent years, I've actually brought uh, experience from music and piano training into the operating room. Uh, I, I've always been struck by the idea that uh, in medicine we, we talk about performing surgery and we call the operating room an operating theater. Uh, there, there are the, the, these words are starting to take on a sort of added meaning for me. Uh, and uh, the idea of uh, elite performance, and really, Brenda, what you were talking about in terms of the initiative for, for, for bringing uh, a scientific uh, framework to studying performance and understanding what performance and performers are in the arts uh, is extremely exciting to me. Uh, and, and I actually await a definition of, of exactly what we're going to be talking about. So that, that, th those would be my opening remarks for now, and I look forward to the, to the discussion. A native of uh, Quebec City, Patrick de Lille Hood finished his uh, BSc in kinesiology in 2015 and his master's degrees in 2017. And he's now back at his alma mater after 40 years working with the Montreal Canadiens where he serves as the NHL team's strength and conditioning coordinator. Currently working on his doctorate thesis at McGill, he has published several essays dealing with training methods, strain, conditioning, and physio physiology, to name a few subjects. Patrick is currently an associ associated coach with the McGill University men's hockey program. Thank you very much, Dr. Racy. Uh, first, I would like to thank everybody to be here. I think it's an honor for me to be part, to be part of this discussion. Uh, I've been the last, especially in the last four years, been surrounded by elite athletes. But today, I know we're going to talk about elite performance, which I think it's very important to differentiate the terminology. Because when we're talking about performance, we're talking about an intent of action. Every time we're, as an example, every time a player was showing up into the gym in the last four years, it was meant to perform, to perform. Even if it was just a training or on a nice session or everywhere. And if we took the other part of the, the terminology, the elite is not the level of the athlete, but the level of the performance. So an elite performance is a very high intent of action. And I think this is very important to define because after, we, after that, we can look into the process and understand what is a performance for us. For me, as myself and in my research, and we also apply the same, the same thing with uh, our hockey team and with the Montreal Canadian, we're determining a process with some KPI, some key performance indicator that's going to bring us to the end result. And the end result is not necessarily the, the elite performance, but it's going to be the process that we're going to be evaluating and reevaluating to see how we can bring, in my, in my case, the athlete to this end result. And that's what's going to compose our elite performance. Thank you. I think we're going to transition now to the question period on our session today. And I'm happy to be able to pose the first question. And um, Darius, this one's going to go to you first. Uh, so thinking in terms of training strategies, do you see similarities in the physical and mental preparation of elite performers? For example, in music, in athletics, in surgery, and of course, in other fields. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about this uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and my first response was, would be to say absolutely, but also to only to a certain extent. And I'll, I'll qualify that. Uh, certainly on the physical side, uh, everyone functioning at an elite level uh, is, is expected to perform at sort of the outer, outer limits of their capability or certainly at the top of their game. Uh, intense physical training and skills training uh, is assumed. 
Uh, and even the idea of developing these kinds of physical motor habits early, uh, although it's not necessarily exclusively required to be done early, but if it can be, uh, often often pays off, certainly in athletics, certainly in, in arts performance. Obviously, one isn't going to start training as a surgeon uh, as a five-year-old, but uh, you, you, you understand what I mean in terms of de developing these kinds of, of um, motor patterns. And, and, I, and I'd say the same would be true on the mental and behavioral training uh, side as well, uh, particularly beginning at a formative age. Uh, both uh, or all of these areas uh, require baking in and learning of key concepts and principles, and the earlier these can be can can be put into mind and and become part of move from the conscious to the subconscious, as it were, uh, the better. But where I think things might start to differ a little bit for elite arts performers, if I can call it that, just so that we ha we're developing the terminology as we go along, is that there's an audience involved uh, as far as the arts performer is concerned. And you can say that to a certain extent in, 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 in sports, but really uh, the, the goal in the other elite performing disciplines is to, uh, you know, to singularly get the job done, be it uh, you know, hit the ball, sink the basket, get the perfect 10 at the Olympics, that sort of thing. But the elite arts performer is performing for an audience. This is their raison d'etre. And I wonder if that variable now casts a somewhat, there's still gonna be similarities, but casts a somewhat different light in what goes on in the body and the mind of the individual. Um, the performer, the arts performer is also interpreting uh, certainly, uh, one can see elements of creativity even in, in athletics, uh, uh, cer certainly situationally, for example, uh, how the play is going to be run or whatever, but the, some of these things might be made up uh, as, as one goes along in the moment. But still, the goal is a singular goal that's irrespective of an audience that might be secondary in, in, say, in say, sports. But for the performer, the elite performer, the whole, their whole reason for being is interpreting. And to do that at an elite level is, you know, remains to be seen, and I'm very excited to understand what this might mean. So uh, th that would, I, I, I think that's probably a good place to, to stop, uh, but it opens up a lot of questions for me. So I'd be interested to hear other, other thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting, I think, uh, perspective of that integration of the audience into the mix. Um, I wondered if uh, Richard or, um, or Patrick wanted to uh, add their thoughts on this particular question. Richard, do you want to start? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I had a, a funny reaction when Darius mentioned how early the training can start. But how, of course, for a surgeon, you wouldn't start at age five. Last year, a student in my class sent me a YouTube video of a woman surgeon who was training her two-year-old to do surgery using uh, Play-Doh. And it was very sophisticated surgeries. It was just amazing to watch. But when I saw it, it kind of creeped me out a bit because it was so specialized and at such a young age. And I think the big danger with this emphasis on early training and deliberate practice is that all of us as parents are excited to give our kids a good start, to identify their abilities, to develop them. But when you're seeing complex, difficult surgeries being taught to a three-year-old, I don't know, it, it just doesn't seem right. So I think one of the challenges for uh, sports science and expertise is that the general audience out there hears these findings and they may apply them in a way that's not helpful to children. And we see a lot of that in sports. I'm sure Patrick can talk about this with overuse injuries, with burnout. And the way we used to play sports when we were younger is no longer the way kids are, are trained. They're told to specialize, work all year round. At least I think that's what's being done. So I think there's some really interesting things there when you go from the point of view of 
uh, the the young person wanted to become better, and then you think about the motivation from outside and how coaches, teachers, and parents can jump in too early and push too hard. Patrick, any thoughts on early specialization in sports? And link and link to that. Um, what do you think then is the relevance of elite performance uh, for society? How can influence education and, and the workplace, uh, generally speaking? First, on their early specialization, there is a big trend towards this. But like in the last five to 10 years, I think people are realizing that yeah. being a generalist in a young age can help them progress into their sports to a later age. And yeah. from what Dr. Darius said, a, a key word that he said is like their learning principle, yeah. which I think our physical educator are doing a great job to help them learn some principle that are going to help them in the long run, in the like at a later age, being better in their sports, performing in their in their work in the work job or and with like some arts. And why it is important for the society? Uh, I think some elite performance. Well, I think. Again, if we're not looking just at the elite athlete, but elite performance, everybody's going to have to do those performance It's either in their work job. Um, very, very, like, very funny story. I just had a baby two weeks ago <laughs> while going into going to deliver as a woman. It is a performance. It is an elite performance for me. Yeah. And those are very important in the society. I see that again, if we're coming back to the terminology of elite performance, it is a process. It's a building blocks, looking at our key performance indicator that we can help a younger athlete or people in their work in the workplace to build up and get better every day. Yes. Richard, I wonder um, if you could tell us in your view, what are some of the benefits of a multidisciplinary approach in a training environment for elite performance? Um, I think that's a wonderful question, and I actually invited some of the McGill students who won Olympic medals to talk in my motivation class. So Jennifer Heil, who won the gold and the silver medal in the uh, in the moguls event in two consecutive Olympics, came to talk, and in listening to her, I was just stunned by the team that was supporting her for over 10 years. There's financial support, uh, there's exercise physiologists, there's sports psychologists, uh, there's strength and training. And it's a remarkable package. So in, any athlete has to have a variety of disciplines uh, supporting her as they uh, uh, pursue their goals. Now, I'm an Olympic sports fan, and I love the Winter Olympics, and my favorite country has always been Norway, because they're a little country, but they dominate the Winter Olympics. And it turns out for years, they've been ahead of training in training strategies. And one thing I remember is they have their summer and winter uh, Olympic athletes train together sometimes, and from different sports, because what Patrick said is a key thing about uh, uh, you learn the general principles of what it takes to always stay at the edge and to, to find ways of breaking through. And it's all about finding better, more efficient, more motivating ways of training. And you can learn that sometimes from people in another sport, or even musicians can learn it from sports from athletes. I had a PhD student who was a concert musician and she studied with me because she felt that this was 25 years ago, that musicians needed something like sports psychology. So a performance psychology that's specific to musicians, because when you're thinking about why some athletes have difficulty at the Olympics or in a big concert, it's, it's about managing emotions, managing expectations, managing anxiety. And, you know, we can do that chemically with certain kind of medications, but it's probably better if, if athletes and musicians get training in how to regulate their emotions and their preparation and, and train to be ready for 
what's such a difficult thing to do. Oh, thank you. I, 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 have, a, I have a question that goes to all of you, uh, which, which touch a bit uh, upon a little bit of what you said already, but, but just to summarize, uh, and let me start with Darius. Um, could you speak to us about the positive and negative factors, if you feel there are some, in elite performance research and training? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. Um, so if we're trying to understand elite performance, elite arts performance better, that means we want, in, in order to do that, we need to study it. And there are basically two ways to study things, uh, the, the scientific method, a quantitative way of studying things, and even, even qualitative science categorizes and it, it may not it, it quantitatively measure, but uh, there's still, there's still uh, compartmentalization going on. And that will take us forward as it has in any area uh, of study uh, in, historically. But again, because we're talking about art and we're talking about interpretation, uh, I wonder if starting to quantify and score and w whatever it is we do in science, applying it to this particular question which has never really been done before in a, in, a, in, a, in a programmatic way that Brenda is proposing at McGill. Um, I wonder if that starts to create a double-edged sword that one is going to start um, applying this quantification and categorization to performers and performances. In some respects at competitions and examinations, this kind of goes on in a way uh, but uh, might we be exploding this and, and taking ourselves down a pathway uh, that was not intended, unintended consequences. Um, so that would be how I would think about that. That doesn't mean to say that we're, uh, you know, I'm not terribly interested to know where this is going to go uh, and how we can use this information uh, to improve performance. But there is a difference between performance and elite performance, which is what we keep coming back to uh, and, and I think it may be important to really define what, what we mean by the difference between elite and not necessarily elite, but just very, very good. Uh, and, and what is the distinction there as well? Thank you. Patrick, any thoughts on what is, uh, what is good and what may not be as good in <laughs> performance or studying performance? I think, I think there is brought a few good points here, the double-edged sword and one of those is like in research, we have a tendency to be very, very, very precise as like, as we know, and I work in like in the, in the practical world in the four of the last four years, we have a tendency to be jack of all trades and master of none. And I feel in the upcoming elite or for performance research, we need to be very precise, but being able to relate that research to a larger audience and I think that's going to have a positive impact on the society as large and as well as on the elite athlete and elite arts performer as well. The next question comes from our colleague, Bruce Lennox, the Dean of Science. He says, the definition of sports, solo musician, student academic exam performance, excellence, is dominated by the performer being able to deliver at and in a precise time frame. The stress of these expectations can limit many people in participating in sports, music, and even academic activities. So is there a way of modulating these expectations to make each of these activities more inclusive? And his uh, second part to his question is, do these expectations create excellence in the first place? Uh, I think that's a very important and complex question. And there's a lot of evidence that expectations can be very biased so that uh, teachers, coaches, they can look at a child, they can know when they were born, how old they are, and there'll be subtle ways in which they may advantage some children and disadvantage other children. And in my course, I don't intend to do it, but I, I, I think I make a compelling case for how early exposure, having interested 
committed parents who really are trying to develop your talents, going to excellent schools. That gives so many kids such a head start so that if you have some kind of uh, program for the best students, for the gifted students, I really worry that they're not necessarily the most gifted. They're actually the most advantaged. And we know that in our everyday world, there are so many children who are not advantaged. And I think we have to educate the public about how skills and performance develops and how uh, if you're going to look at five years, five year olds and sort them on the basis of reading or on how quickly they learn to read, a five year old from our families will have uh, had stories read to them for about 50,000 hours or something. I may be getting that. No, it's not stories. It's they, 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 they record how many, um, how much speech a parent has, has, has done with the child. And it's like 40,000 of a professional family's child. Middle-class family, it's 20,000. If you have someone in poverty, they've heard 10,000 words, 10,000 words in interaction. And then you're assessing language skills at age five and you sort kids out into the gifted and the non-gifted. And it's just so unfair because what happens in those first five years actually determines the evidence that we make these judgments about. And I think that's true in, in sports and music and everything else. Uh, so of course I would encourage uh, more inclusiveness, but also just a simple recognition that there are advantages that make such a difference in sports and music. <laughs> Mario Lemieux, one of the greatest hockey players ever, he, his, his parents designed it so that he could skate in his house. <laughs> they, would, they would open the doors <laughs> and put uh, ice down in the house and the boys would skate around in there. And most great, uh, Wayne Gretzky had a dad who built a rink in his backyard. It's a real Canadian thing, but his dad was an expert coach and he gave him like superb advice. But only Wayne had paid attention and he had the commitment. His brothers did it. But so I, I think being advantaged and disadvantaged is such an important issue. And we always have to keep that in mind. What we see as talent, sometimes it's really, you know, some talent, but a lot of advantage. Patrick, do you have any thoughts to share with us? I think, I think Richard brought very good point about like kids are at advantage and some kids are at disadvantage and the expectation and the role of expectation in sports so should be managed by the coaches and the organization providing the tools to their athlete to their hearts performers to their surgeon to their, for them not necessarily to be crueling under the pressure but setting their own expectation, their own process for them to perform instead of being imposed by the outside world, some expectation. And I think this comes back to when they're young, developing the principle as there is said, and until them build their own expectation for themselves, either than adding the highly highly pressured world that we're living in that every, everything's on camera now but you can see everything on facebook and see everything on social media if we put that aside and we have a good concentration with coaches with sports organization with hearts program and help our youth develop themselves and setting themselves up with proper expectation for themselves it's gonna help in the long run Darius, I invite you to uh, join in if you sure. want to uh, offer well, something. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as the physician in the room, I should probably mention there are always drugs <laughs> to, help with, uh, to help manage stress and, 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 and modulate the, the experience. The phrase I've been thinking of lately is beta blockers before yeah. Bach, Beethoven and Brahms. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, performers have used them, athletes have used them, everybody has used them. But that's that. But but to be clear, that's to manage a symptom. Right. And what we're really talking about is how, how can one create resilience around uh, the issues that create the pressure in the first place. And I think uh, Richard and Patrick uh, talked about, and again, it comes back to this idea of starting early and inculcating 
uh, principles and understanding of how your own mind and body works. You might be doing that at five years old without even realizing you're, that you're doing it. Um, again, coming back to performance, arts performance, where are the expectations coming from? Are they coming from the audience? Are they coming from within? Uh, you know, and what is the balance there? Uh, for an athlete, uh, it, it's you know, winning the game, scoring the goal, getting the 10. I mean, that's what's creating the, the, the pressure, if you will. Um, but in, in arts performance, there are other in, more intangible variables at, at play. Uh, certainly training the psyche and training the mind to deal with any kind of stress in any profession will be helpful. But how do we do that? How do we understand it? How do we, as I said to you, Brenda, in the past, how do we bottle that and and have it apply across the board to other professions? Uh, someone talked earlier about exposing musicians to uh, s sports psychology and, and thinking. I think the reverse is po po possibly also going to be helpful to expose budding scientists and physicians and lawyers and engineers and athletes to music uh, and music training and what that has to bring uh, in, in the other direction as well. So that would be how I would sort of uh, summarize that question. Darius, can I jump in? I would like to ask you, ask, ask you a question. Like you're talking about like uh, the audience putting the pressure on musician, but is the musician very similar to a 100 meter runner? He's performing against himself. So is the expectation coming from the public or from his own self? That's that's a really good question. I, I, I jotted a few names down. We've been talking about elite, elite performance. Uh, some of you may know that Vladimir Horowitz, the pianist, was notoriously nervous in front of audiences. And I think he left performing for 20 years because of that. Uh, Glenn Gould had a, a, a disdain for audiences. He thought they were out for blood at times, and he left a live performing entirely and went into the studio. Uh, there, you know, there are a number of examples that are like that. Uh, I think about uh, uh, another one, um, Maurizio Pollini, pianist, uh, a supreme elite performer but actually has been criticized at times by audiences for being too perfect, whatever that means, too cold, icy at times. I love him, but that's, but that's, just all, that's subjective, which is also important in this discussion. Arthur Rubinstein, uh, the legendary pianist, uh, he was a god amongst audiences, but he played a lot of wrong notes, you know, so <laughs> that, it, it didn't seem to matter. So what, what do we mean when we say elite arts performer? Uh, again, uh, comes back to this this definition that we really need to keep in mind. Um, the Olympic gymnast is not going to get away with wrong notes on the floor or at the vault, uh, but uh, but that it it becomes a different kind of issue in arts performance. So that's why I'm fascinated by this. Uh, that there are going to be parallels, but there are really some distinct differences here, and we need to tease out what they are. And the last thing I'd say about science is that we going into this, we need to be careful not to just measure something because we can measure it, but really think about what's going to be important as we move forward. Well, this has been a fascinating debate. Thank you very much. Uh, I know there is much to be said, but unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time here. So I would like to, to give the speakers opportunity just to provide us with some uh, final thoughts uh, before we wrap up. Uh, and again, thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I'm sure the audience uh, uh, is delighted to be following uh, what you have to say so far. So let me start with Richard. Any final thoughts? Yes, uh, we've talked about sports, we've talked about music, and what I want us all to remember is that these are fun activities that children are drawn to. Parents are excited when their kids do these things. Uh, they have their first coaches, their first teammates. It helps them feel connected and competent. It serves a really valuable function in children's lives. Unfortunately, I think organized sports, I don't know that much about organized music, there's kind of a funnel system where as the years go on, the emphasis on like 
being a better performer becomes more and more focused and kids get the message that they're not good enough anymore. And you would think, okay, they're not good enough to play in a league. Well, at least they'll keep playing in their leisure time. But my sense is that that doesn't happen and that getting caught up in becoming an elite performer and then getting perhaps harsh feedback that, boy, you don't measure up. You're never going to be a basketball player. You're never going to be a, a, a good flutist. That kind of shuts down a whole area of development that can provide so much joy, so much companionship throughout the rest of our lives. So I think we always have to remember a balance between, you know, identifying the elite performers who really have a chance to do something special, but making sure that the 98% who aren't going to reach that level don't somehow get the message, you know, you're not elite. Uh, maybe it's time to find something else. So I want to, for us to think about how to nourish the, the diverse range of kids. And even if they're not so good, uh, it's great to see kids and adults doing things. Like I think there is a, a, a concert band for people who are not good musicians. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. And I think that's a wonderful idea. And I have a friend, he and his wife, there's a place you could go and, and do like old bands and play music and have recordings. And I think that's great. We need more of that too. So we need a focus on the elite performers, but the joy in doing sports and doing music, we don't, we don't want our young people to lose that. And if we've lost it, we want to see if we could find it again. Thank you very much, Richard. Patrick. Well, first, thank you very much for having me in that discussion. That was very fun. And I think it starts from there. I think it starts from discussing. And as we could see, we all have different definition and maybe a solution of, or part of a like, start of a solution for Richard would be to adjusting our definition of elite performance, depending on our population that we're working with. Yeah. Elite performance is not just for elite athlete, but you can have an elite performance with a youth athlete and yeah. uh, playing soccer with his friends. He can yeah. still be have an elite performance, depending if he responds to the process and he, he gets yes. better as the way goes on. And I think this is very important to take into consideration. Thank yeah, you very agree. much. Indeed. There it is. Uh, thank you. I, I also want to th thank uh, everyone for uh, a wonderful uh, discussion and thank you for having me. Um, just as a closing thought, I, I keep coming back to this difference between the arts performer and the other uh, types of elite performers we've been talking about. And I'm reminded of the, uh, the adage, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Um, and if there's no audience, uh, what is the purpose of the arts performer, uh, really? I, I've had uh, many musician, professional musician friends that I that I am privileged to play with. Uh, uh, they'll often make this comparison. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're just musicians. You're, you know, saving lives and helping people with their health. And I don't like it when I hear that. I often turn that around and I say, well. If it weren't for you, what would be the point of saving the life? You know, um, so I, I think this this idea of the dynamic between the audience and the arts performer and the elite arts performer uh, is going to be a very interesting one to explore. That may have differentiating aspects versus the other types of elite performance uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, thank you again, uh, Darius, Richard, Patrick. Thanks, uh, everybody who's watching this. This was a very, very interesting uh, discussion. I'm sure everybody enjoy, and it's uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot more to be said about this um, this topic, so important for for society in general. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.